Okay, so Palm Sunday. Uh, you know, okay, I got a Westphalian take on Palm Sunday. I got to tell you that. I understand Easter. I get that. The resurrection Sunday and everything. And all my life, Palm Sunday's been a big high holy day in every church I've been in, you know. Uh, and, um, but, okay, here's the Westfall take. It's the day that reminds us how fickle and odd the crowd is and how so often we really don't get it or connect. So it's kind of a reminder of our oddness and, and our lack of uh, follow through and faith, you know, to have this cheering progression, uh, uh, praising Jesus and then turning and killing him within a few days, not even a whole week, actually, uh, just five days or so. That's all it took. And the, and the whole, the, the same crowd changed. And, and so I, I always thought that this is funny that we, that we celebrate this, uh, triumphant entry and, and it's fun and all those things, except that I'm just so reminded in the back of my mind of how long is this going to last, you know? And, uh, but I do want to read the passage uh, from Luke chapter 19. Um, uh, Jesus went on ahead uh, going up to Jerusalem and as he approached uh, Bethany at the hill the, that they called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you and as you enter it, you'll find a colt tied there which no one's ever ridden, untie it, bring it to me. If anyone asks, why are you untying it? Tell them the Lord needs it. And so they did. And, uh, and then verse 35, they brought it to Jesus. They threw their cloaks on the colt, put Jesus on it. And as he went along, people spread their cloaks in the road. And when he came near the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they'd seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the church leaders in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he said to them, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. And as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. And he said, if you had only known on this day, what would bring you peace? So Lord, we do rejoice and we do celebrate you're coming into our lives and into our world and, and we honor you. And at the same time, uh, we're very aware um, how fickle we can be and how fickle our world can be. And so teach us and, and show us how we might see you even in the midst of a crowd. That's our need today, in Jesus' name, amen. So the thing is that, um, uh, there is a uh, crowd mentality. And uh, those of you who are psychologists, all of you who are psychologists know this. Um, the, the people can act differently when they're in a group than they do when they're individuals. And, uh, and there's been a whole lot of studies done on what happens when a person who certain values and beliefs and things that they'll do. They get into a crowd and suddenly they change and they start to take on the temperament of the people around them in the crowd. Now this can be really positive, you know, people who are, who are kind of scoundrelly, uh, you know, like me, you know, they get into a crowd of people who are really doing good stuff and they feel, okay, I can do this. And you know, we kind of go along like that and there's encouragement, and there's support in that and there's community in it. But there's also, uh, Pulls that take us in other directions, and and someone can uh, do things in a crowd, and then later on look back on it and go, "What was I thinking? That wasn't me. I, I, why did I do that?" And um, and and so I wanted this week to look and see specifically how Jesus related to the crowds, uh, because. Um, he didn't seem particularly enamored by them, but at the same time, he wasn't afraid of them. And, um, and so uh, I, I looked at a few things, and in uh, Matthew, let me see if I can find it here. Matthew chapter nine. Uh, 
Verse 35. Okay, so uh, Jesus is going through all the towns and the villages and he's uh, teaching and preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing diseases and sickness. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. He had compassion on them. Why? Because they were harassed and they were helpless. Like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to the disciples, the harvest is plentiful, the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into this harvest field. You know, there's something about Jesus looking out and seeing the crowds and in, instead of being caught up in it or enamored in it or afraid of it, he just responded with compassion. And, and I thought, what, what is that? I think that it has to do with not seeing a crowd, like I would maybe see it, but that he actually sees the people that make up the crowd. That you have to go past the surface and you, and you realize that each person in that group is a real person with real issues, with real fears, and with real hopes, and with real sadnesses, and with real joys, and with real uh, successes, and with some failures or embarrassment, that they, they have all of that, every single person in the crowd. So when he looks out the crowd, he goes, wow, I really care about her, her, him, them. That's so different than, than often how we respond. And, um, and so then I thought about uh, this uh, scripture that we have today in, in Luke 19. Jesus is going to Jerusalem, uh, kind of the culmination of his earthly ministry. And on the way, he stops and looks out over the city, right? And instead of going, whoa, cool city, he goes, weeping over the city. Why? Because he sees her and him and them with real lives and hopes and fears and confusion and dreams and unfulfilled dreams and looks at her and he goes, if only they knew, if only they knew what would bring them peace, wouldn't that be something? if they could just know. And so um, I think about this and I go, what is it that we can, um, we can glean from this? Um, Jesus said, you know, the harvest is plentiful. A lot of people out there, a lot of needs. He didn't say, Go take care of them. He, he, he said, pray that, pray that the Lord will send some workers out. And I thought about that this week. And I thought, you know, I think in, over the years, I thought that we should be praying that the Lord that would send out managers or supervisors into the field. Because, you know... Uh, you don't want just people going out and working in the field. You want people who have supervisory skills and insight and big vision. And, uh, you know, I mean, that's what pastors do, right? You know, we, we go to Dick's and bring the burgers here. We don't actually do the work. You know, that's a big difference, you know. And, uh, yeah, that actually is a big difference. Uh, but um, so I, I was thinking about this and, and I thought, what does it mean uh, for us to look at the people around us, to look at the crowds and see them the way Jesus sees them as real people with real issues and then to allow ourselves to go out as workers in that field. Now, anybody here grow up farming? Yeah, a little bit. A little I, bit. I picked strawberries. You picked strawberries. <laughs> I picked a box of them at the QFC the other day. <laughs> <laughs> That's similar, but yet different. <laughs> Anybody else? Farming? You got a little bit? Cool. See, my dad was an agricultural engineer, 
and his dream was to farm and to ranch all those things. My mom grew up in a family of West Texans who all had ranches and farms, and she said, I will never, ever do that. You know, we were, you know, 15 minutes from Nordstrom, or we're not going there, you know. That was, that was our family. So, um, but, uh, so I like the idea that uh, uh, my brother started, you know, the Westfall wineries, uh, winery down in, uh, with the vineyards down in San Diego. And I really like that idea. Uh, it's kind of civil farming, right? And so, you know what he does? He calls me up and he says, John, come on down. Come on down, I want to show you things. We're gonna, you know, there's gonna be a crush and all these things. And uh, you can come out with me to the vineyards. Now, every time he calls, I go down there. And I don't know whether I should wear a suit because, you know, he probably wants me to maybe give a little inspirational seminar to the workers, <laughs> you know, uh, and inspire them as they go about this. Or maybe he wants me to think up a tasting plan, you know, for the region. Uh, or marketing strategy. You know what happens? We, I get down there. He says, okay, get in the truck. And we go out to East San Diego, out to where the vineyards are. And I go, where's the workers? He goes, here's a hat. <laughs> here's a big bucket. You start here, I'll start over there and we'll meet in the middle. That's it. That is so wrong. I have come down from Seattle. I'm, I'm here, I'm a, you know, a gifted person. I wanna see the workers do this. And you know, I, I'm gonna tell you something about picking grapes, okay? Just in case you haven't done it enough. It is not glamorous. Okay, I don't care how many, uh, it's, it's not Lucy, you know, stomping around in the barrel, you know, uh, it, it's not any of that. It, it's uh, bugs, lots of bugs, really, and spiders and bees, stinging bees are just all over. And some of the uh, grape stuff, whatever they call, what do they call that? Cluster. <laughs> Cluster. Uh, but some of the clusters are too old, you know, and they're, they're not good, and some aren't ripe yet, and everything. And you have to go along and find the ripe ones and do it. And anyway, so in the sun, and you do this for hours on end, and uh, keep loading the bucket, and then you have to haul the bucket, and then you throw it in the truck, and then you go back. To you. you do this all day long. And I suddenly realized God is teaching me what ministry is. It's not uh, ad ministry. It's not ad ministry. It's just doing it, just being there together and doing it. And that there's there's ripe grapes to pick and there's wrong grapes to pick. And you get the right ones and da da da. da and it takes all day. And you're totally exhausted and tired. And you wonder why you flew all the way down there to do that. And then I thought. Okay, how does this translate into how we are to go out into the harvest, how we are to go out into the crowds, how we are to see the crowds and relate to them around us? And I realized, you know, uh, when you go out and you, and you talk to people, you realize that they're so much like you are. They're just folks, you know. Um, and they've got their issues, and usually those don't come up right away. Uh, you know, you might know somebody for a while, and suddenly you find out what's really going on, and uh, and then a door opens up. And but the thing is that um, some people are just not ready to be harvested. And I spent a lot of time uh, in, uh, in pastoral ministry trying to convince people that it's time for them to be harvested. It's time for them to meet the Lord. It's time for them to get their life together. And, and you know, uh, I actually got pretty adept at arguing people into God's kingdom. 
I could, I, I would practice answers. I was stupid. I'd practice answers so that whatever question came, I'd have a good answer for them. And sometimes a verse I could point them to. And, and I'd do the, and, and I realized this is so not what Jesus did. He didn't argue into anybody into anything. He had this great sense of, you know, you're not ready. Why don't you go live for a while until you hurt bad enough? And then we'll talk, you know? That's so hard to get that you actually respect people in the crowd enough that you don't push them. You don't prod them. You don't guilt them. You, you say, you know, you need to live for a while. And you know, when life smacked you around a little bit, kick the stew out of you some, then maybe you'll be ready for what God wants to have happen in you. And, uh, I think that that gives us a, a, an incredible uh, freedom because um, nobody wants to be dragged into the kingdom of God. Nobody wants to be dragged kicking and screaming. And, and, and no one, I don't think, wants to be treated superficially. It, it's so interesting that in this passage in Luke 19 where Jesus is met with the cheers and the celebration and the glory, it says he stopped and wept for the city, right in the middle of it. He just stopped and wept for the city because they just don't know what's going to bring them peace. I think that um, it's time for us to notice the people around us and, and notice them enough that we could weep for them that we could actually care for them. We could care about uh, whether they have peace or not. We could care about whether they, uh, their lives are, are becoming what they'd hoped they'd be. We could care about whether uh, the Lord's alive in them and, and, and bringing healing and hope and strength and courage and all of those things. Um, we could just see the crowd differently, even as we're in the middle of it. Um, Frederick uh, Buechner, kind of an eccentric guy, he writes a lot of books. He actually is an ordained uh, Presbyterian pastor who's never served in the church. I don't even know if he goes to church. He got ordained <laughs> and, uh, and then just sits out in his farm in Vermont and writes. <laughs> Some of his books are weird. You know, he writes about watching the raindrop go down the side of the barn. <laughs> you know, anyway. It's the kind of book <laughs> pastors read, you know. Okay. So, but anyway, this is in uh, the Magnificent Defeat. Is this book here? the The power of God stands in violent contrast with the power of people. Isn't that interesting. Violent contrast. It's not external like man's power, but internal. By applying external pressure, I can make a person do what I want them to do. That's man's power. But as for making him what I want him to be, without at the same time destroying his freedom, only love can make that happen. And love makes it happen, not coercively, but by creating a situation in which of our own free will, we want to be what love wants us to be. Think about that. How does God work in us so that we actually want to be the men and the women that he's always envisioned us as, that he's, that he's loved us into being, that he created us for, and we've gotten off track and we've gotten diverted. I know I have. Oof. I, I'm a man of many diversions, you know, and, uh, and I resist being squeezed along, pushed along, manipulated. I don't like that. And yet, God, in his own way, loves me into a place where I want to be the person that he made me to be, right? And then we begin to treat each other that way. 
We, we, we can love each other to the point where, where we want to become that. Now, that is so contradictory to the way things work uh, practically in our world. Um, uh, but I think there's some real power in, in coming to grips with the fact that um, Jesus, looking at the crowds with compassion and inviting us to go out as workers, uh, him looking over the city in the midst of the hallelujahs and, and, and weeping. And the people are probably wondering, why, why is he crying? We're, we're celebrating him. What's he doing? You know, stopping here and crying. Um, he's seeing us differently than we see each other. He's not satisfied with the superficial. He's not satisfied with the surface. He's not satisfied with, with okay, everything's great. Because love draws us to a new place without squishing our freedom. thinking about what what needs to happen in, in us uh, as we go toward Easter what needs to happen um, I'd love the pretending to go away you know the the needing everything to be all right I'd, I'd love for that to go away I'd love for um, for us to actually welcome the changes that God has for us. And, um, and I would love for us to know what would bring peace. What is it that will bring peace? If Jesus weeps because we're, we're people who are wandering around and we don't know what will bring us peace, maybe it's time for him to show us what, what will bring peace? In the midst of this, you know, interesting, wonderful, crazy world. Um, personally, you know, I'm in a turbulent time. I've, uh, I, I know that. <laughs> it's um, way too turbulent for me. I prefer to be surrounded by people who are in turbulent times, and then I just kind of encourage them, you know? But it's really different when I'm in the turbulent time and going, wow, it's, it's hard to hang on. And, and so I'm trying to practice uh, experiencing peace in the middle of all of that. And, and I gotta tell you, it's, it's not a natural thing for me. Um, I'm more of a fighter kind of guy. Um, I know who I am when I'm fighting, controlling, and manipulating. Yes, you know, I got that. I don't know who I am when I'm saying, uh, your grace is sufficient for me. Uh, Lord, have your way in these situations and these people. And, um, and so this is the week for me to um, specifically, tangibly ask. Lord, Show me what brings peace for me. Show me. And I think it's all right for us to ask, actually. I think that, it, that uh, we hesitate to do that because we don't want to be pushy to Jesus, you know. Uh, I think if his, the power of his love draws us and to where we want to become the person that, that his love sees, then I think we have a right to ask and say, Lord, what, what's going to bring the peace? Help me to see it. Even in the midst of these things. Uh, help me to, to look at the crowd around me and, and not be caught up in it, not be impressed by it, and not be irritated by it. Just see what people in the eyes and see 
who they are. And I think it was interesting when he's riding uh, the the donkey down to, down into town and the crowds there and everything like that. I, I I've often wondered if he's like noticing people who have been around him before. Oh yeah, there's that uh, woman, the single mom with the kids, and she's been struggling with that. And we talked about that one night. And here's this guy who came to see me about this, and and he's he's seeing individuals. <clears throat> I want him this week to see you, to look deep into your life and your heart and your fears and your issues and draw you with his love, draw you to become the person that he's always intended you to be and then gives you his peace. I don't think we should settle for less than that this week. Maybe the lady, the clerk at the QFC who was checking me out today with the donuts, Donna, maybe uh, she um, was right. Next week is going to be a big week, she said. I thought she meant, oh, you know, it's Easter, it's a busy time for pastors. But I think what she, now I'm saying, no, no, she was speaking about this. She's saying this is a big week because this is the week that you ask the Lord to draw you with his love, to become the person that, that he's always loved you and intended you to be and shows you his peace. I'll tell you what, that would be a big week. That would be a big week, wouldn't it? So let's ask for that. Let me, let's, let me pray with you. Lord, we do sing hallelujah and we do uh, express praise and we do uh, celebrate your life and your love. But beyond all of that, Lord, we thank you for seeing us in the crowd. We thank you for seeing who we are and what we've become and what we might become and where we've been and all of those things. And we thank you that with love you draw us to you. So Lord, we would not want to wander around like a sheep without a shepherd, and we would not want to be people who don't know what will bring peace. So we're asking today, come into our lives, come into our hearts and minds and relationships and health issues and struggles and career issues and finances and all those things that happen, and bring your peace and your presence. Lord, you said you stand at the door and knock. Well, we hear you, and we're saying, come on in. Come on in. It's more than time. And we thank you for your presence and your peace.